Good afternoon and welcome uh, for this podcast. Uh, I am Aurelio Porfiri and today I am very glad that uh, I have as a guest uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Clapton that is a singer and uh, also a teacher but he is also an expert about the topic we will talk today uh, because uh, you may know that yesterday um, yesterday April 21st Uh, it was the 100th anniversary of the death of a very famous singer. And uh, Nicholas Clapton uh, wrote a book about the singer. And we are talking about uh, Alessandro Moreschi. Uh, Moreschi is known uh, maybe for a, a quite uh, uh, famous recording and is called uh, the, the Last Castrato. And it was called... Uh, L'Angelo di Roma, uh, the, the Angel of Rome, because of, of his voice. So I want to thank uh, uh, Nicolas uh, for his participation in my podcast. And I want to ask him first uh, why he uh, got an interest about Alessandro Moreschi. A good question. And I, I have a good answer, I think. Um, I've been singing as a countertenor for ooh, over 30 years. And uh, countertenors often sing repertoire from the 17th and 18th century, and therefore we come across the castanati very frequently. We are frequently called to um, replace them, substitute for them in the music of people such composers as Handel, uh, Vivaldi, all of the Italian school from Monteverdi through to, ooh, as late as even... Uh, some of my colleagues, Bellini. So um, I came across Moreschi first when I was looking into the whole history of this phenomenon. Uh, and especially there's a wonderful book uh, by a man called Harriet um, about the Castrati, which was written many years ago. It's, it's a wonderful book, not least because it's full of inaccuracies. It's full of uh, made up history. Um, he was not a researcher. He was a diplomat. And uh, he he would never let a good story pass, even if they weren't always totally accurate. And he wrote about Moreschi and the phenomenon of Moreschi having been recorded and having been the last castrato, which indeed he was. Um, and these records, of course, I was immediately fascinated by the idea that recordings of a castrato, which for most people is a long distant, long forgotten phenomenon from the 18th century and earlier, uh, existed. And indeed, there are nearly two dozen tracks. And I became very interested in this. And I was doing a concert in London uh, with some colleagues from the Royal Academy of Music, where I used to teach. And uh, a lady came up to me at a drinks reception after the concert and said, I'm a publisher. I publish biographies. Tell me a few musicians who need to have a, a biography written about them who do not have one. And I don't know why, Moreschi's name came into my mind. And I said, how about this? And I told her a little about the phenomenon, the recordings, the whole musicological, religious and political situation in which he lived. Um, and she said, yep, I like the idea of that. And within a week, I had a contract to write the book. And, here, and it happened. So that's, yes, that's and also your book, uh, uh, can you remind our uh, listener what is the name of your book? The book was published in two slightly different versions. The larger one is called Moreschi and the Voice of the Castrato. And uh, it was published by House Publications and is still available. It's still available. It's still in print at £16.99. There is also, interestingly enough, I have had a long association with the town where Moreschi was born, Monte Compatri, near to Frascati, and an association there published an Italian edition of this book. So it exists in Italian as well, and also in French. Also in French. And yes. uh, um, w when you uh, started to uh, write the book, uh, uh, how much do you know about Moreschi? I knew what was written in the standard dictionaries, the standard encyclopedias, and in this book by um, Harriet, Angus Harriet, the castrato in opera. And uh, that was about all. And it was very interesting trying to find out more, which is why, of course, I went to Monte Compatri in the first place. 
and had some wonderful experiences meeting people, some of whom were a little hesitant, but some of whom were very helpful. Um, uh, in fact, many of whom were very helpful, not least the parish priest who helped me to look in the parish records. Um, he had worked in Britain, so had en excellent English. My Italian was not so good in those days. Uh, it's better since, I hope. And people were very, very helpful and became very, very interested. Uh, they already had a choir, Coro Alessandro Moreschi, and they held a little festival. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. And I became involved in that. And for many years, I used to go and sing uh, repertoire that he had sung and other repertoire associated with the Castrati at their little festival in the spring every year. And uh, what is the, the most astonishing thing that you discover in the process of writing your book? Oh, gosh, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I think the most extraordinary thing of all is the voice, because it does give us a glimpse into a long forgotten world, the way the voice is constructed. I remember coming up with a phrase in English uh, almost suddenly, on the spur of the moment, as we say, um, that Moreski sounded a little bit like Pavarotti on helium. You know, if you inhale helium and then try to speak, your voice goes very, very high. And everybody speaks, uh, a man will speak at least an octave higher and sing also an octave higher. Because the point about Moreski is that unlike countertenors today, who sing nearly all the time in falsetto, he sang in his voce di petto. He sang in his real speaking voice. For, to our ears, unbelievably high. So he sang like a tenor who is singing impossibly high in full chest voice. And then the sound flips into a much more almost flautato soprano sound at around the C sharp, about an octave above do centrale, as you would expect. It's like a tenor, but an octave too high, as it were. And this was very, very interesting to look into this and to try to work out how his voice actually functioned. And then, to, of course, to go into the extraordinary history of the castrati in, uh, well, particularly in Italy, uh, where they came from in Europe, which is still something of a mystery. Uh, we know they were around in France in the 16th century. We know there were eunuch slaves in the Ottoman Empire very early. Well, not the Ottoman Empire, but in the, in the caliphates in uh, North Africa and in the Near East and in the Middle East and also in Spain. At some time, something happened there. We don't really know what. Um, there were also castrato singers in the choirs, in the choirs of the Byzantine Empire, most uh, famously in the choir of Hagia Sophia in uh, what was then Byzantium, Constantinople, now Istanbul. Um, and they all disappeared after Constantinople was sacked uh, in the Fourth Crusade in 1214 by the forces of what you might call a Western European army. Uh, and they all just kind of disappeared. And then they may have turned up in funny places like Norman kingdoms in Sicily. How they got from there to Spain, to France, to the papal choir and to various noble courts in Italy is still something of a mystery. But I, I, I want to ask you uh, one thing and then uh, I, I want you to help to give some definition uh, so for our listeners uh, that maybe are not familiar with this uh, forgotten word as you mentioned and, uh, and it is. Uh, uh, I, I, before I want to ask you something, uh, you say that you sing as a counter tenor for more than 30 years, so it's a long yes. time. And I'm yes. sure uh, also in your very young age you came uh, uh, in contact with this recording uh, uh, from Moreski, you know, the, the, the famous recording where uh, he sings uh, some uh, uh, sacred uh, arias and other things. So uh, before writing the book, uh, what was your impression of this recording? I knew very, very little. I think I might have heard the most famous of the recordings, which is probably the track of uh, the Guno Ave Maria, Ave Maria, based on the first prelude of Bach's Sporting yeah. Preludes and Fugues, the Guno Ave Maria. I'm sure I had heard that, and I must, I'm sure then, in my innocence and ignorance, I thought, gosh, that's strange, and thought very little else about it, because 30, 35 years ago, I wasn't so interested as I am now 
in the way voices work. I was still probably then in those days trying to find out more about how my own voice worked and mm. getting it to work well. Um, mm. And I suppose m the more one becomes involved in the teaching of the voice, which I've also done since about 1990, uh, the more you become interested in how the human voice functions as just a pile of muscles and ligaments and air and lungs yes. and so forth. So for, for our listener, uh, in very few words, uh, can you give some definition, uh, explain to them, uh, because maybe not all of them knows uh, well about uh, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, of, of singer. So what is a castrato? A castrato singer was someone who was castrated before puberty between the age of probably eight and about 12, maybe 13, before puberty, to preserve the high register of their voice for the rest of their life. And this had an effect not only on their voice, but on everything to do with their body. Uh, because if you deprive the adolescent male body of the male hormones, especially testosterone, it affects the way your bones grow. Uh, testosterone is a signal hormone to make young men grow. It also tells the bones when to stop growing. And if that doesn't exist in the body, the bones go on growing for much longer. So very often the castrati, this was not the case with Moreski, oddly, but very often the castrati were very, very tall uh, and they had disproportionately small heads and very long arms and very long legs. And the caricatures we frequently see uh, of castrati, particularly from the 18th century, were not that much of a distortion of what they may have looked like. They were often very tall. Um, from the analysis that's been done rec in recent years in Italy of the remains of Farinelli, which were found in Bologna some time ago, um, it seems that he was nearly two meters high, one meter mm. 90, two meters, which is very tall now. So in 1740, he would have been a giant. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, uh, can you uh, uh, can you tell us, uh, uh, can you tell our listener uh, what is a counter tenor and uh, uh, what is the difference? Of course, obvious difference. Uh, yeah, well, we are we are complete men. Thank God. Uh, the practice of castrating uh, young boys has ceased. Thank goodness. Um, but uh, we sing. Let me go back a stage. Every male adult has two voices. They have the voice you and I are talking with, and this one, the one that you might, if you were laughing a lot, if you were laughing hysterically, or if you're mm. screaming or yelling mm. at someone, your voice will flip into this very easily. It's mm. basically a mechanism for the release of tension in the throat. But mm. some people find that their voice works better and makes a more beautiful sound in the falsetto than in what is called the modal voice, which is the speaking voice. So every male voice has these two mechanisms and countertenors find that their high mechanism, their falsetto mechanism works better and more beautifully than their speaking voice. And therefore they use it and use it professionally. That's so th th there is any difference between countertenors and falsetist? Well, there is to some extent because most countertenors nowadays are using almost exclusively falsetto. I'm sure all falsettisti, even historically, would have used their speaking voice their ordinary speaking voice as well when they were singing low because if you want to be audible you've got to otherwise your voice more or less disappears however there are also people who are what the french tradition calls the haute contre who are very very high tenors who are using their modal voice very very high and they can often sing in the same register as falsettists but they are using a tenor register they're using the full closure of their vocal cords, whereas in the falsetto register, because, because of mechanical changes within the throat, the vocal folds do not vibrate along their entire depth and their entire length. They vibrate on their edges, and they could therefore produce a different kind of sound. And uh, uh, I, I want to mention something that uh, is also the occasion why I... Uh, I knew about your book because, uh, as you know, our own uh, meeting was many years ago. Uh, we, we, we met uh, virtually. Uh, so today is indeed the first time we talk directly. 
uh, yes. but we, we correspond, we say, because yes. my teacher, that uh, it, I think it was him, Maestro Bartolucci, uh, mentioned to me about uh, your book uh, or, or that you uh, did some research in the Sistine Chapel or you yes, thought... Yes, I did. Yes. I was very much helped by the director of the Sistine, uh, of the archives of the Sistine Chapel, who was yes. very, very, very helpful to me. And, and uh, I, I want to uh, mention to you something, babe, because I think it's you. Of course, you know already very well. Uh, you know that one of the student of, of Moriski was uh, Domenico Mancini. Uh, oh, yes. Domenico Mancini, that was a falsetist, and you know that the falsetist, indeed. Uh, so Alessandro Moriski died in 1922, so 100 years ago exactly. But he has a students uh, among them, Domenico Mancini. And the falsities basically remain in the Sistine Chapel until the time of Maestro Bartolucci, because he was the one that removed them in favor uh -huh. of the Pueri Cantores. And I heard a recording of Domenico Mancini. Uh, that there are very few recordings, but he, his, his voice is really fascinating. I mean, uh, I am so fascinated by the, the voice of... Uh, um, the people that uh, can sing uh, this, the, with this kind of range, uh, that the men can sing this kind of range. So wh what do you know about Domenico Mancini? Well, um, not, a, not as much as perhaps I would like to. I think one of the most fascinating things about Mancini is that, yes, he was a pupil of Moreschi, and he was heard by Maestro Perosi, who, as we all know, was very against the Castrati, wanted yeah, to get rid of them, yes. and in, succeeded in so doing, and, and, and pushed out Mustafa and all that story of the... the he he didn't want happened. a Mancini because he thought he was a thought Castrato. thought Mancini was a Castrato, exactly. Yeah. So what Mancini was, like any good student should be, was a very good imitator of his teacher. And I think it is wonderful that he was able to do that so well that Perosi thought he was a castrato. But, but this he is what also Moreschi asked him, you know. There is a famous recording of Mancini that uh, uh, he remember about his lesson with Moreschi, and he say, oh, yes. but Moreschi uh, see, always sing himself, and he exactly. asked me to imitate what he was doing. Exactly, exactly. And to be able to imitate not only what he was doing technically, but actually the type of sound the fullness of sound that the castrato would have had from singing in this basically registro di petto, voce di petto, mm. rather than with just the edges of the vocal folds. It is a remarkable achievement that Mancini was able to do that. One must admire him for it. And that he was able to fool Perosi, I think, is a wonderful irony. Mar and he did, uh, th there is, uh, I, I don't know if you know about this, uh, but probably you, you did, but uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, Mancini wrote uh, some kind of uh, uh, his uh, memories, uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, he talked about uh, the 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 last year of Perosi because they, they were very complicated because Perosi was mentally ill, uh, and so yes. there were many yes. many uh, many problems, and also he talked uh, with resentment about the decision of Maestro Bartolucci to uh, re replace completely the falsities because he say oh but the falsities are guide of the of the children and it, this was used for many many years uh, and it was yes. very successful yes how very interesting i know of those memoria but i have never ever been able to find a copy i would love to find a copy of them it's it's proved, ah. i did try but it proved impossible maybe now with since i mean it is now Oh, 18 years, 19 years, nearly 20 years since I started work on my book. So, yes, 20 years, actually. So maybe it is now available online. To be honest with you, I haven't looked. It is not. It is I not. Should. It is not. Ah. It is not. Caspita. <laughs> it's a shame. No. It is not. But uh, uh, I, I, I can tell you that... Um, uh, yeah, they are very interesting. Yes, uh, and, uh, and sure he, 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 he say about uh, yes, and uh, I, I want also to um, tell you uh, about something. Many years ago, 
as you, you may remember, I was one of the organists of St. Peter's Basilica, and uh, I play yes. for the people audience uh, on, on, uh, uh, on Wednesday. And every uh, Wednesday, there, were, there was a singer that uh, uh, sang the, the, the psalm. And uh, one yes. of these Wednesday, it came uh, one singer that was a countertenor. And, and the, ah. probably that was the, the first time in my life that uh, I hear uh, a live. And I was so fascinated. I mean, the, the voice, uh, but why for you, uh, the, the voice of a countertenor is so fascinating? Okay, you are a countertenor, so you should not be maybe the one to say it, but... Uh, uh, according to your experience, why the people m- uh, is fascinated about this kind of weird voice? Because you I see know, a man it is, singing... It is a very strange thing. I really don't know what that's about. Um, I, I have a feeling... I mean, what is very interesting is that a lot of people, particularly people who are not professional musicians, who are just lovers of music, are completely fascinated by the what they call the purity of the sound. I mean... In England, there's a great obsession with, you know, the purity of the boy soprano voice. Mm. And this seems to extend to the countertenor as well. I think the otherworldliness, the strangeness is a part of that fascination. And this may relate to people's psychological, even maybe psychosexual way of relating to sound. I don't know. I, I This is this is a... <laughs> This is not a topic for half an hour's talk. This is a topic for 20 years' research, probably. And uh, think, w- think... according to your opinion, in, in, what, in, in which country these kind of voices are more appreciated? Well, it seems to be more or less everywhere now. I mean, when I started out singing, which was in the, well, really in the early 80s, um, there were certainly uh, falsesist countertenors. Let's use, let's use countertenor in the modern sense. There were people singing in America, a few. Uh, there were people singing in Germany, one or two. There might have, there was certainly um, one or two in France and the Low Countries, Country. Belgium, Netherlands. And, but nearly all of them were in England. Nearly all of them were in England, and that had an awful lot to do with a supposed tradition, which we had had in English cathedral and chapel choirs for what five or six hundred years. Now. One must say that a lot of doubt has been cast on the truth of that uh, tradition uh, in in recent years, and it seems that an awful lot of what has been regarded in the last 60, 70, maybe even longer years as countertenor repertoire isn't at all. Uh, and uh, there were some mistakes made back in the, after the Second World War, when the wonderful composer Michael Tippett was running the music at a college in London called Morley College, which was kind of evening classes at an education centre in London. And he was, he loved very much the music of Henry Purcell. And in the music of Henry Purcell, you very often see solo parts marked countertenor, countertenor, counter, all over the place. In some pieces, sometimes three or four of them, and he couldn't find voices that worked. It was too high for many tenors. And if a female contralto sang it, he didn't like the sound quality he made. He said it was too thick and opaque. And then he heard about this singer called Alfred Della, who was singing in the choir of Canterbury Cathedral. And he went to Canterbury and he heard Della. And for him, this was a revelation. And he said, you are an alto, because everybody used to call themselves male alto, a man who sang in the alto range, the contralto range, if you like. Um, you're not a male alto, I will call you a countertenor. Well, yes, Michael Tippett might have called him a countertenor, and Alfred Della was a wonderful singer, but he's probably very, very much different from what Purcell thought of when he was thinking of a countertenor, which was much more like the non-falsetto French haute contre, which was always a very rare voice. The falsettist who sings better in falsetto than in voce di petto is rare enough, but a high tenor who can sing very, very high in a very light registration and in a very, what's the word I want? Well, just in a beautiful way, uh, is much rarer. And there are still very few of them around. There are some um, and singing now very beautifully, but it's, it's a very, very rare voice. 
And uh, uh, to uh, conclude, uh, uh, if uh, someone wants to learn uh, to sing like a counter tenor for you, where, where are the best places where someone can go Ooh. to learn? Well, that's a very interesting question. I was never taught by a counter tenor. And in many ways, I'm very glad because there was quite a lot of bad, bad teaching going on back in the 70s and early 80s. Um, I was always taught by by people who were uh, either in one case pianists or by women. And really, if you want to learn to sing, it doesn't matter who you learn from as long as they know about the voice. And the real difference is between a falsettist countertenor and a female mezzo-soprano are anatomical. But what the singer does is very similar. And it doesn't matter what sex or what gender you are. If you sing well, if you're taught well to sing, you will be able to sing with that voice if there is the basic material there. Uh, you need someone with a sympathetic ear, someone who can teach you how to manage the change between the voices. It's not easy. And I haven't sung at all today. Uh, it's it's difficult and you need to learn how to do that. But any teacher who knows about singing can teach you that. The problem is not teaching a counter tenor how to sing well. It's finding a teacher who knows how to teach anybody how to sing well, because as you know, as well as I do, there is a huge amount of appallingly bad teaching in this world. Yes, and uh, uh, that, that is uh, a reality, but uh... We hope that uh, this kind of uh, tradition that uh, uh, is so uh, important also for musicology because uh, the music was produced for this kind of voices uh, in, in, in reality will uh, continue to exist. And uh, we, uh, of course, want always to remember people like Alessandro Moreschi that uh, was certainly a, a, a protagonist of his time and unfortunately today is uh, um, very much forgotten and uh, this is something that uh, of course uh, we don't like so i i, I want to thank uh, nicolas clapton for his participation and for the insights that he has given to us uh, that i'm sure are very interesting and i want to thank our listener and remember them that uh, um, this is uh, for the a Cantus a newsletter. So if you want to subscribe, you go to cantus.substack.com and then you will uh, subscribe and uh, you will have a lot of content, including podcasts, uh, scores, articles, uh, videos, and many other things. There are different subscriptions plan, so you can decide which one you want to choose. So thank you again uh, to um, uh, Nicolas and I will uh, uh, 